Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 10 through 15. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And you, if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. So far, text. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, chapter 16 that I just read from you and chapter 15, the one before this, are very well known for their parables. In the previous chapter, Jesus tells the story of the lost son. It's one of unbelievable grace. The son who deserved nothing, who went off and squandered all of his inheritance, who came back and wanted to be treated as a pig in the father's pen, just a hired hand. He had nothing. He had reached rock bottom. And the father lavishes love on him. Reckless love. It's a beautiful story, and yet people didn't really appreciate it. Listen to the last verse of that parable, just the previous verse in this chapter. We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. God treats his love and forgiveness like a toddler trying to put ketchup on his hot dog. Not sure if that's enough. I guess we need to make sure that all of the dog is complete and most of the bun too, right? It just takes a little bit, but God doesn't stop there. He gives us so much. Lavishes so that we're just covered and all we can taste is his forgiveness. That's how much he loves us. And almost in contrast, to that, Jesus changes gears and he goes into the parable of the shrewd manager. And it seems a little confusing, doesn't it? And yet maybe it would help if you heard what Jesus' enemies were saying. You just have to go back one page. First verse of 15, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus says, yeah, I did. Of course I am. I wish that they all were here. I want to love them. I want it so that everyone knows how forgiving I am. I want them home, just like that father welcomed his son with open arms. But now, we hear about a dishonest manager who gave away his boss's money and goods and lost his job. Now this parable, when you first hear it, almost raises more questions than what it answers. And yet Jesus' point, just to kind of front load a little bit, is that just because you you should be, he wants you to be reckless and free with his love, does it mean you need to be reckless and free with money? You can be as shrewd as a dishonest manager. The problem is that Jesus uses a bad example to prove his point. In contrast, hear this parable. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. He's going to get fired. The manager said to him, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, 
how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Now, if you're scratching your head at this point and saying, why was the manager furious? He sees it as gamesmanship. He sees it as well played. He sees it as, yeah, he wasted my money again. But you know what? He was smart. He got away with it. Jesus' point is not that you should be dishonest. It's not that you should lose your job. It's not that you should cheat people. It's that when you look at the business world, and I know that some of you have lived and maybe you still live in it today, when you look at the business world, it's cutthroat. It's dangerous. Many of you are shrewd with your money. Good. See that there is a day of reckoning coming. You should be reckless with God's love should you be reckless with your money. No. Just because the toddler can take the ketchup bottle and squirt the hot dog, and that's great and fine, doesn't mean it's good when the toddler grabs dad's wallet and turns it upside down the house and just shakes everything out. That's bad. God says, be careful. And listen to what he says in verse 9. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. His point is just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you have to be clueless. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean people need to take advantage of you when you go buy a car. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you should overpay on your bills. There's no reason for that. You can be shrewd as well. And, and he goes on, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, that's more wholesome than what it sounds at first. Is God saying, buy friends? Not exactly. Last Sunday, I was in Ottawa, Canada, and I did an evangelism seminar. And the churches there said, how can we get people to come and see us? We haven't had visitors in a long time. And I said, well, is it wrong to put a bouncy house on the corner with a sign saying, bounce for free for an hour this Saturday? No. Is it wrong when they show up and they bounce in the bouncy house? When they get out to tell them, hey, you're invited to come back to a friendship Sunday. We're going to have a free lunch afterwards of hot dogs. Is that wrong? Have you done any evangelism? Have you told anyone that Jesus loves them yet? No. But you may have just made a few friends. That's a lot of what God is saying. Is it wrong on Friday the 26th of October to open up your trunk and ring the parking lot and have little ninjas and goblins come around and give them candy? No, it's called trunk or treat. It's even better if I walk around with little Jesus stickers and slap them on hands and say, come back in a month. We're going to have a Christmas for kids. And you can hear about the real gift that God gave you at Christmas what we do. That's being shrewd with the wealth that God has given us as a church. Next Sunday, we're going to plan that even more in our congregational meeting. We're going to talk about Christ's love. Yeah, we know about that. Our calling in life? Well, our calling is to give glory to God. And our calling is to bring as many people with us to heaven as we can that when we get there, we're going to see faces whom we met, whom we told about Jesus. You can have an eternal impact on people's lives through doing that. Jesus goes on. This is where our text actually starts. Verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Do you understand the difference there? Christians in general would admit, what's more important, the dollar bill from the children's message or Jesus? Well, obviously, Jesus, Pastor, of course, money's more important. He's the most important thing in my life. True, but when people look at you, do you act that way? Would they think, obviously, the most 
and most important part of this person's life is their God? Or is it something else? You remember, your God isn't necessarily a little idol that you have to bow down to. It could be anything. It could be your kids. It could be a football team. Anything that's more important than your God is an idol. And beware of that. He finishes, If you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And before you scratch your heads, do you realize that Jesus is talking about you? Someone else's property. Who really owns all that you have? It's God. You are still just managers, right? You're not going to lose your job, but one day you will lose your life. He will take it from you. And he will give you eternal life. It's a pretty good trade, right? There will be a day when you'll be out of time and you won't be able to do anything else. What can you do between now and then with the things that you have? Remember, it's all his. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So what can I do with the time that I have, the treasures that I have, the skills that I have to give glory to God and bring people with me to heaven? That's what he wants you to consider. Verse 13, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That was, of course, the basis for our children's message. And I suppose I just have to ask it, which one do you serve? I don't know. When I look at you, I have a very optimistic view of all my flock. And yet I don't know exactly what's in your heart. So I'm going to ask that you just take a personal inventory and say, where do I stand with my God? Is he the most important thing in my life? Or has money or material possessions crept in? And does that take first place? The good news is that our God still acts like the toddler with the ketchup bottle. And he covers us completely. So that no matter how great our sin is and no matter how often we misplace our trust in our God, he doesn't run away. Ben, can you push the slide? That's not a hot dog. That's the best I could do. That's enough ketchup, isn't it? No, it's not. I still see French fry. Yeah, it almost looks disgusting, and yet that's how God wants your life to be so that all you can taste is his love. That's how it is. No matter what your past has been going forward, Taste his love in your life. Next Sunday, come to the Lord's Supper and taste and see how good he is. Trip over the baptismal font when you walk through. And remember, I've been sealed with him with water in the word. I'm forgiven, and I'm his child. Christ's love, I know. My calling, of course, it's to give glory to him. And finally, I want to tell as many people as I can about my God, so that they might join me in heaven one day. May God bless us as we do this. Amen. Please stand.